Welcome to those who are joining us today for Mission Momentum, which is uh, I try on a monthly basis to have either topics, presentations, or conversations pertaining to our mission as a Mercy Catholic College. And because this month is Black Catholic History Month, I reached out to Dr. James O'Toole. Uh, he's the author of a book about the Healy family called Passing for, for White, Race, Religion, and the Healy Family. Uh, of course, it includes uh, Bishop James Healy, who is the second bishop of Maine and commonly referred to as America's first black bishop. So I thought it'd be interesting to have a conversation about Healy, especially since, Jim, your book uh, gives a great amount of detail, biographical detail, not just about him, but about his family uh, and how it is that they succeeded as much as they did. And it is quite a success story about this family. Uh, given the circumstances that both they were born into uh, and then the circumstances into which they come to service to the church. Uh, so welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> I thought I'd start with just some biographical details. So if we could talk a little bit about, you know, um, Bishop Healy and his family and his siblings. Uh, how, first, first of all, remind me, how many siblings did he have? Uh, there were uh, eight uh, children of the original couple who lived to adulthood, uh, and I believe there was one uh, yes. one additional baby who uh, who died. Yeah. Um, but uh, there were eight uh, who, pretty much all of whom, was one exception, uh, who uh, went on to really remarkable careers in circumstances that wouldn't um, have predicted that. Yeah, and, and let's talk about that because the circumstances into which they were born were not those that would, what well, would certainly have um, boxed them in from any kind of success. So uh, right. share a little bit about the, the parent, their parentage, where, you know, who were their parents and, and where were they born and the circumstances they were, and, and not just the conditions, but by law, what they would have been considered then as a result of their birth. Right. The, the father is an Irish immigrant to Georgia in the early 18 teens. So this is a generation or so after the American Revolution. Uh, Georgia is uh, still a relatively new, unsettled place. But the father is an Irish immigrant uh, to Georgia, uh, acquires land and, and becomes a, a planter. And like most of the people in his neighborhood, he was a, he was, he was a cotton farmer. The mother of the of this group of brothers and sisters was a former was a slave. Uh, in fact, one of the father's slaves. Um, uh, her origins are unclear and largely unknown in terms of the historical record. You know, slaves were not important enough for anybody at the time to write down much information about them. But the father acquired this this woman, uh, Eliza as one of his slaves. And um, together they had this group of children. Now, it was not at all uncommon uh, at this time, you know, well before the American Civil War, not at all uncommon at this time for slave owners to have children by their slaves, by their, by their women, women slaves. In most cases, the the owner, the white owner, would also marry a white woman and have a so-called respectable family. But what's a little unusual about uh, about the Healys is that um, fa the father uh, in the family, uh, Michael Healy, Michael Morris Healy, never married anyone else. Um, uh, and so, you know, that usual dynamic of a of a white public family, but then children. Uh, of mixed race by the slaves uh, was was not the case uh, here. It was illegal in Georgia for blacks and whites to marry. So uh, the original couple could never officially marry uh, in, in any way, but they lived together for um, more than 20 years as husband and wife. And there's every indication that, you know, they considered each other uh, husband and wife in everything but law. And from that family, um, this remarkable group of brothers and sisters um, uh, emerged and all went on to remarkable careers through the rest of the 19th century, many of them uh, connected to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, as a result of this marriage, of this union, the resulting um, skin tones varied quite, quite 
variably, right? From very, very light skinned to darker skinned in terms of identifiably African American to less identifiably uh, African American. But in terms of skin tone in Georgia, that didn't matter, right? As a result, right. Of, this, a result of this union, simply by factor of the union, and that one of them in this union was black. Legally in in Georgia, that made that would have made them slaves, correct? That's, that's right. In in uh, in Georgia law, as in the law of most southern states uh, at the time, children took the condition of the legal status of their mother, not their father. Uh, and so, in this as in this case, if the mother was a slave, the children were by definition slaves as well. I've always thought that those laws were a kind of tacit acknowledgement on the part of society that, well, of course, slave owners will be having illegitimate children by their, by their slaves. Uh, of course, that, that will happen. But the law said, we don't want that to get in the way of ordinary inheritance for the white family that is usually there as well. So the children at birth are all defined as slaves. It is also illegal in, at that time in Georgia for a slave owner to free his slaves. So the father um, cannot free, cannot change the legal status of his children, cannot free his, his uh, slaves uh, in any, um, in any in the, under, under the law. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think he makes the decision early on that these children who will always be defined as slaves if they stay in Georgia, I think the father decides early on that he's got to get the children out of Georgia uh, and into the north. And as they achieve school age, more or less, uh, the children are all sent uh, to New York originally and then and then to Massachusetts so they can live as free people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And while th that's th that status changes, the racial attitudes of the north are not a lot different than the south. Right. That, that's absolutely correct. Um, it's not it's not enshrined in law, but the racial attitudes in the north are are very similar. And what what's uh, we see coming together uh, in the period around the Civil War is what came to be known as the one drop rule, um, that if a person had one drop of ancestral African blood, that defined them as a black person, um, no matter what they looked like. Um, and um, uh, because they were defined as blacks, the presumption would have been, well, there are certain advantages that they'll never be able to take uh, to, to use, uh, even in the North. Um, you know, there's no, uh, in many places, there's no formal racial segregation, but social conditions, they would have always been seen as inferior. Um, they would have been uh, there would have been strong disincentives for them to marry a white person. Um, so, yeah, the, the legal situation is different in the North, but the social attitudes are very much the same in the North as they are in the South. And that's where the, the question of, of um, complexion um, becomes important. As you say, the, the, of the Healy siblings for whom we have photos, we don't have photos for all of them. Uh, there is a real range of racial complexion. Mm -hmm. And and as we've just said a couple times, several times here, in spite of both the legal status in the South and attitudes of the North, for the most part, they succeed. They succeed, and it's these conditions. So let's talk a little bit about how is it they're able to succeed in the way that they do. And we said we're not we're talking about a man who becomes bishop. We're talking about a man who becomes a president. Uh, we're you know we're talking about people who uh, these siblings who attain high offices within the church with, and other institutions uh, in spite of these conditions, both social conditions and legal status. So talk a little bit about how were they able to do so? What, what allowed them or what helped them do so? Right. This is, this is the primary thing that interested me in the family in the first place. Here's this group of uh, siblings born with all these social disabilities, we can call them, barriers to their achievement. and they don't just survive those circumstances, they positively thrive. Uh, and they go on to have these uh, remarkable careers. James is a priest and the Bishop of Portland, eventually. His younger brother Sherwood is a priest, uh, dies fairly young, um, but was apparently probably destined to be a bishop himself 
Um, there's another brother, Patrick, who becomes a Jesuit uh, priest and serves as the president of Georgetown uh, University. Um, three of the, there are three girls in the family. Two of them become uh, sisters uh, in various orders and superiors in, in their orders. One marries uh, and, and has a family. And the youngest, uh, a younger son, is, um, is Michael Healy, named for his father, who becomes a captain in the Coast Guard, um, uh, which is a really remarkable career. So it's not just that one of them is breaking all these social barriers. The whole group of them uh, are, are uh, breaking these social barriers. And somehow, and this is in a way an enduring mystery of the family, somehow they, they avoid all the consequences that society intended to impose on people like them. Um, and um, to some extent, they do it simply by ignoring the rules, uh, and yet somehow they get away with it. Uh, and my argument in the book is that they use the Catholic Church as an agency that will permit them to do that, mm -hmm. um, that they kind of step outside uh, the identity of black and white uh, and, um, and uh, latch on to uh, their identity as Catholics, particularly as Catholic priests and sisters. Mm -hmm. And the, in, 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 that, in that regard, too, within, with in the church, there is a figure that's of particular importance. I know, I remember uh, particularly for James and Sherwood, um, that's the bishop, right? The bishop, is it Fitzpatrick? I'm trying to recall right. the last name. Yeah, their, their first um, uh, patron, if you will, and the person who sets them on this road is the, is the um, third bishop of Boston, a man named John Fitzpatrick. Um, it, it's, it, it's a, it all in the end goes back to circumstance and happenstance. Uh, the father um, uh, is apparently, he would periodically go back and forth between Georgia and New York on business. Uh, and, one, and during one of these trips, he's on a steamboat between Baltimore and New York and just happens to run into Bishop Fitzpatrick on the boat. Um, pure, pure coincidence. They get to talking. Uh, Father, Papa Healy uh, describes this the dilemma he's got about getting his children out of Georgia. And uh, Bishop Fitzpatrick says, uh, well, I've just opened this college in uh, Worcester called Holy Cross. Why don't you send your boys up to Holy Cross? Um, and uh, that then provides uh, Mr. Healy the opportunity to get the children out. So the boys are sent um, up, to, uh, up to Holy Cross. Um, the sisters who can't enroll in Holy Cross at the time uh, follow. And, and so Massachusetts really becomes their, their headquarters. And again, it's all thanks to Bishop Fitzpatrick and the, the pure coincidence uh, that um, uh, the two ran into each other, you know. If they had taken different boats that day or one the, the next day and so on, none of this would have happened. Uh, it really is. It really seems providential. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's not that I mean, we, we also have to acknowledge it's not just that there were um, race, racist social circumstances in the north. They also existed within the church. There were sure. there were leaders within the church who had racist attitudes. Yet Fitzpatrick seemed. Um, um, do we know why Fitzpatrick seems so willing and able to say, why don't you send your children to Holy Cross? Yeah. I mean, I, we'll turn to you for your question. Yeah. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to say. I think uh, uh, Fitzpatrick is Bishop of Boston in the 1840s and 1850s, a time of um, um, very strong anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic hostility. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth, but, but I think Bishop Fitzpatrick thought, well, you know, Catholics in uh, Massachusetts are not in such great position. Anybody who wants to join, come on in. <laughs> we need all the help we can we can get. Uh, but he really turns out to be a uh, a patron to the family. The younger sisters, for a time, stay in the home of his biological sister. Um, so he really becomes a, a patron and a, a kind of father figure to these younger children. Uh, away from home. Mm -hmm. uh, Sister Murray, did you want to say something? Well, something? well, it's actually a comment because in listening to you, James, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, Subversive Habits. Yes. 
uh, because so what you're saying about some of the Jesuits or even religious communities, they they really did not accept women of color, and there are stories there, um, and these are most these are stories from the archives of religious communities in the United States. The, uh, the Sisters of Mercy, by the way, opened theirs totally because mm -hmm. we did not accept women of color. And so in different places in the United States, even if someone passed for white, they took the person. But for example, when the mother came to visit, I think eventually the woman was asked to leave because they couldn't have her black mother visiting right. and so forth. So it's just a comment. It's it's a quite a revealing and good study if someone wants to pick that up and read it. That's right, and and there were there were eventually some uh, orders of sisters which were specifically for black sisters, uh, yeah. sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, for example. And yes. one of the reasons these orders formed was that um, African American women couldn't join, um, wanted to be sisters themselves, but couldn't join the, the white orders. And of course, later on too, um, North and South, uh, the church's record on uh, racial segregation um, was not always spectacular. It's not, good. Oh, it's not um, spectacular. There were, um, uh, you know, in, uh, integrated parishes in the South, for example, into the 1950s, um, if there were blacks and whites at, at mass at the same time, Blacks had to wait until all the whites had received communion before they themselves could go and receive communion. So yeah, the the, the but by becoming Catholics and becoming, you know, um, prominent in in the church, the Healy's were by no means uh, entering uh, an uh, an institution no. that uh, had what we would consider um, uh, proper or uh, enlightened racial attitudes. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to distract us from it, but I, you know, it's it's uh, that's part of our history, and it's important right. to. It's quite. It was quite a revelation. I'm um, anyway. It's all the more reason to say how to be that it's remarkable that Bishop Healy got to be a bishop and serve and more somewhat accepted. Right, and one of the one of the mysteries that I tried to tackle uh, in the book was um, uh, okay. We can understand why he would want to de-emphasize his racial heritage. We can understand why he would want to pass for white, as, as the phrase was. But what about all those people full of the common attitudes of American society about, you know, racial disparities and what black people can and should be allowed to do and not do? What about all the rest of the people in the church and out who knew the family story, uh, who knew that there was black blood in, in the family? Why, in a way, if I can put it this way, why did those people let this group get away with it? Uh, they were clearly violating the rules of society. Uh, and again, we can understand why they wanted to. Why did other people look the other way? Why, why, in other words, was something that should have been supremely important, why was it in their cases not important uh, or something that, people, that other people were willing to overlook? Um, and again, I think the decision uh, to become uh, priests and sisters, to assume formal positions in the church and so on, uh, I think that that gave them an out uh, in a way and, and uh, uh, allowed uh, people to say, well, you know, there's this aspect of them, their racial heritage that isn't very good, but look, they're, they're doing good in the church. They're good priests, they're good sisters and, and so on. And, and, and to that point, you know, it was that, their father helped them get to the north. Bishop Fitzpatrick, you know, helped aided them as far as education goes, and eventually in the church. Uh, but also, they were really good at what they did, right? That right. James James, um, James Healy was a very good administrator. I mean, that's, that's clear right. not only from your book, but from the other the previous book, Beloved Outcast. Both books talk about he was not just a competent. He was a respected administrator in the church and pastor mm -hmm. in the church in Boston, right? He didn't right. just he didn't just serve in parishes. He helped get churches built. He helped the cathedral get built, right? I mean, he was 
he had a played a, 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 a important role in the building of the cathedral, right? That's right. James, well, it's, uh, James um, uh, was involved in the very early years of um, uh, planning for and building the the cathedral in Boston, the the cathedral that is still uh, that is still used. And then at some point, James was assigned to another parish. And James's younger brother Sherwood became the rector of the cathedral, and Sherwood actually finished the construction of the of the cathedral while James was building his own church only a few blocks away. Uh, so yeah, these, this was a very uh, this was a very accomplished um, group of, of people. Uh, and as a matter of fact, their brother Patrick, uh, the Jesuit, who was at Georgetown at the time was basically reconstructing the Georgetown campus. Uh, the main building on the Georgetown campus is called Healy Hall, uh, and it's, it's named for him because, because he built it. So yeah, this was a very, a very competent uh, group of people. They were probably better educated than most American clergy at the time. They'd all studied in, in Europe. Um, uh, and so that, that, I think, helped, but they, they certainly had a, a, a good deal of... Um, native ability uh, to do a variety of things. And you mentioned that you know, one of your qu driving questions was, how was it that the people who knew their own family history and story, nevertheless, you know, it's not let them get away with it, simply respected yeah. the work they were doing, acknowledged or respected the work they're doing. But you also talk about the family's approach as well. That is, by looking at some of their correspondences, Mm -hmm. it's, it seems that the family's approach, at least we know from James, and I remember from James and Sherwood in particular, that they also had it internalized in some way white attitudes in terms of their own, not only their own thinking about themselves, but actually their own thinking about fellow African-Americans as well. I think that's right. And that makes yeah. us, I think, a much more complex uh, story. In fact, if I recall, when the father dies, uh, the inheritance includes the slaves, which the family has sold off right and not right. Food. so i think that makes this a much more complex story as well can you talk a little bit about that the the internalizing also in some ways of white attitudes by james and sherwood and others yeah they they certainly did uh, internalize those attitudes the parents die within six months of each other uh in 1850 <clears throat> and uh, fortunately i would say um the mother dies first um, because if the father had died first, uh, the mother would have been sold. Uh, but when when the parents died in the settlement of the estate, at that time, the father owned about 50 slaves, um, both grownups and, and children. And as a part of liquidating the estate, settling the estate, the slaves are sold off in several different lots. Um, and they, these were, you know, kind of um uh, garden variety at the time slave slave auctions so in that sense the family is profiting uh from uh from from the returns uh on the slaves and i think one of the effects that may have had uh that affects this question of their identification with the white community it made them it made them better off than most americans it certainly made them economically better off than most catholics uh, at the time uh, most immigrant catholics and i think i think those upper class kind of attitudes from the white community um, came to seem natural to them and they came to share those uh, those attitudes um, so i think there's there's that class dimension to this as as well as the racial one um, uh, that um, uh, underlined any um, disinclination they may have had to challenge uh, the the common attitudes of society racially and, and otherwise, and and it, it uh, in James's case in particular, um, uh, that left him with very little sympathy for early labor unions, for example. Uh, you would think a Catholic bishop in the 1880s and 90s would be very much in favor of workers organizing themselves and so on. Um, James Healy was very suspicious of, uh, of labor unions uh, and did really nothing to, to promote them. So that kind of conservative political attitude, I think, was, uh, was built in and was part and parcel of the, of the racial and class identities that they had taken on. Yeah, I, I, he lives at a very interesting time in American Catholic history, because as you note in the book, too, you also have the emergence of the Americanist right. uh, clause and, and, and co controversies and tensions.
uh, that, that surround people like Isaac Hecker, for example, the founder of, of the Paulist mm -hmm. priest, uh, and he falls on the side against the Americanists. Right. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, he's he's um, he's he's joining white society, uh, both uh, both Catholic and otherwise, pretty enthusiastically. I think I think you can say he's briefly on the board that um, supervises uh, what were then called the Negro and Indian Missions, uh, an effort by the church to try to do um, evangelization in the African-American community among, among former slaves and among, among Native Americans. Um, I think he, he's put on the board in the first place because of the, the Native tribes in Maine, um, many of uh, which had uh, long Catholic connections. Uh, He's on that board. He shows no interest in evangelization of African Americans on any kind of uh, broad scale. Um, uh, someone asks him about it, and he says, "Well, look, there are no black Catholics in Maine. Uh, that may or may not have been true, uh, but that uh, that's a measure of where his where his interests were." And again, I think stepping back from that is a part of this general um, conservative outlook that he takes to to matters in the church and outside, and. Again, what makes him an, an, a, a, such a complex figure is on this, on the uh, also pertaining to the tribes. He both, in his writings, expresses some rather stereotypical attitudes about the tribes, while at right. the same time publicly defending the tribes' rights to, we would say today, autonomy or somewhere sovereignty right. in some way. Right. So again, a very complex figure in that regard. Yeah. 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 And I have to think that that I don't know. Maybe at some level, he didn't know quite what to do. Uh, he, he was happy that these groups had been Catholics for generations. Um, but in, in light of the rest of the population of Catholic Maine, Irish immigrants, French Canadian immigrants and so on, um, increasingly concentrated in places like Portland and Lewiston, um, you know, he's, they're just higher priorities. Those folks are, are just higher priorities for him, I think, than, than the tribes. Let's talk a little bit then about his um tenure as the Bishop of Portland. Uh, he, is, he is the second Portland, Bishop of Portland, effectively the second Bishop of Maine. There's only one diocese. It's the entire state here. Right. Um, what can you tell us about uh, his tenure, how he was regarded, how he was received um, here? Yeah, he becomes the, the uh, Bishop of Portland in 1875. Um, and um, at that time, the Diocese of Portland is all of Maine and all of New Hampshire as well. Vermont is a separate is a separate diocese, but uh, but uh, Maine and New Hampshire are together uh, until 1884, when Manchester, New Hampshire, is split off as a as a separate diocese uh, for the state of New Hampshire. So he, he's bishop in in uh, Portland from 1875 to until his death in 1900. Um, that's a time of increasing immigration uh, in Maine. So one of his concerns is opening new parishes uh, as the population increases and uh, recruiting um, priests to serve in those parishes. Uh, he's also interested in opening parochial schools in those parishes. Not all bishops everywhere were, uh, were keen on, uh, on opening parochial schools. In fact, his um, his uh, one of his patrons in Boston, Archbishop John Williams, um, doesn't is, isn't really very excited about opening uh, parochial schools uh, in in Boston um, uh, during his tenure, which is roughly the same as uh, as Bishop Healy uh, there. Uh, I think Archbishop Williams thought, well, Catholics are essentially taking over the public schools in terms of enrollment and teachers and whatnot. So why have a separate system? But in Maine, Bishop Healy is very uh, is very eager that uh, parishes have schools, and to that effect, uh, he's eager to recruit uh, communities of sisters to come and um, and teach in those schools and and run those schools. Um, uh, the Sisters of Mercy, the Sisters of Saint Joseph, uh, and and other groups are, are are brought in. So the the practical. Um, necessity um, of, uh, of the expanding uh, diocese um, uh, occupies his time and, and serves as a suitable forum for his administrative uh, abilities. 
Um, there's also an orphanage uh, in Portland uh, that uh, that he opens. Um, and uh, while he's doing all of that within the church, <clears throat> he's also making um, the church more publicly visible in the state. Uh, he has uh, uh, connections with um, the political leadership, uh, governors um, and mayors of Portland and, and so on. So he's, he's working to enhance the community, both in the specific uh, institutions of the church, but also more, more broadly and becoming a kind of public figure that, that even non-Catholics would recognize and would respect as a, as a civic and community leader. And my my own field is is um, biblical studies, but inevitably that includes history, and I love history. And I love especially when you study history to see the different figures who you find out end up intersecting with each other. And right. and maybe now that connects to your own personal history, as I share with you, I came back to the church because of the Paulist priests, and so to see this in his story, this interaction with Isaac Hecker was interesting right. to me. Well, in in Maine, of course. Uh, his interactions are with another seminal figure, I would say, in the American church. And I know certainly Sister Mary would agree with me. And that's Mother Frances Ward, um, who right. brings the Sisters of Mary to America. I think Sister Mary is in 1843 when they come here to America. Um, yes, 1843. Right. Yeah. Of 1843. And then 1865 yeah. is when they end up coming to uh, Maine. Yes, um, Bangor. And yeah. so, of course, Bishop Healy and Mother Ward have interactions with others. Can you, can you tell, tell us a little bit about his relationship with her? I and with the oh, her. I don't have any recollection of his um, relationship, say, with Mother uh, Frances Ward. Uh, certainly, um, what stands out in my mind in our history is that, you know, when the two dioceses were split, when mm -hmm. the Portland Diocese and the main diocese included New Hampshire, but when that split came, he knew ahead of time it was going to happen. We right. had Sisters of Mercy <laughs> from New Hampshire he, serving in Maine because it was one community. And at a certain time, he went to the Reverend Mother and he decided that the sisters who were um, from the New Hampshire area but serving in Maine would stay in Maine. Right. So, you know, he just decided that. I mean, we've always gone back in our history and looked at what was our role with these bishops because we were not diocesan. But right. there was a tradition of the Reverend Mother saying, yes, Bishop, whatever you say. Um, but that split. Um, so we have sisters and young sisters buried up in uh, St. Dennis, North Whitefield. Mm -hmm. uh, who were from New Hampshire, uh, and they cared for the orphans in that little or a school. Uh, and so yeah. there would be sisters in the cemetery in Calvary, also from New Hampshire. But to do that without any consultation, of course, that on that day, <laughs> and so some never went back to New Hampshire. That was, right. You know, the, 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 the rule was that when the split came, um, sisters would stay where they were. Uh, exactly. at, at, at that point. And, and as you say, he knew that the split was coming in a way that, uh, that um, uh, Mother Ward, Ward did not. Of course, it was not uncommon um, at the time for sisters and bishops everywhere to get into these kinds of disputes. Oh. Uh, bishops had, you know, their own plans for what they wanted to, uh, to develop, and mm. uh, they were in charge, as they thought, and the sisters had their own plans, and sometimes it, it took uh, yeah. some negotiating for that to, to happen. In the case of, of um, uh, Mother Ward and, and her community, as you, uh, according to canon law, they were not uh, subject to the authority of the bishop to the same right. extent that others were, so there was always there was always some tension. There was always mm -hmm. some uh, negotiation. The context for understanding a context for understanding that, which I think is important, is we have to remember that at at this time, in at the end of the nineteenth century and well into the twentieth century, 
there were far more sisters than there were priests. Mm -hmm. In many areas, sisters outnumbered priests by factors of four and five to one and, and even more. Um, so, I mean, on a practical level, that meant that the institutions of the church, schools, hospitals, orphanages, uh, social works of all kinds, um, really depended depended on, on the sisters and, and not um, uh, surprisingly, they thought they knew what they were doing mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, wanted to, and wanted to do it. Uh, and again, that sometimes brought them into tension with the bishop. That isn't to say that everything was tension uh, between no. them, but there were disagreements about next steps all along the way. So the sisters in New Hampshire right now, the Sisters of Mercy in New Hampshire, are actually celebrating their 165th anniversary. Uh -huh. And the reason they're not celebrating, say, 170th is because um, they may not have many around to celebrate the uh -huh. numbers yeah. of us. So they're right. celebrating their 165th. And it occurred to me, it's probably, well, it's with Francis Ward. It would be Francis Ward. Um, yeah. And I don't know what's in their annals about Bishop Healy and that side, their side. The New right, yeah. I, yeah. I, I didn't look at any of that, but no. I, I, I suspect that there will be things, things yeah. from their side of the street. Well, and, and I remember reading, well, first of all, we have to acknowledge, right, in, in the person of uh, Bishop Healy and in Mother Ward, we have two very strong personalities. Right. Mm -hmm. Also, again, who were not just competent, but remarkable administrators. Yes. Remarkable mm -hmm. evangelizers, remarkable uh, uh, creators of ministries, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it seems it's not a surprise the two of them initially That's right. would, would have That's tensions right. with each other, right? It, right. Uh, you know, I think it happens in the church. It happens in politics. People who are that much alike are yeah. probably going to come into conflict at some point. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, the other part that I was just looking this up quickly. So at the time, you said I think Bishop Healy died in 1900, correct? That when right. Presented. So another interesting uh, intersecting fact of history is where the cathedral is at, the communities he served, which would have included the Irish immigrant communities. Mm -hmm. And one of those families would have been the Feeney family on Montjoy Hill. Mm -hmm. And their son, Sean, would have been six at the time of Bishop Healy's death. But we know him later better as John Ford. So we have oh, uh, we have, we have that his, his history in some way also mm -hmm. intersecting with yeah. this uh, interesting history of the diocese right, and Bishop right. Healy. Right. The yeah. other connection um, uh, that puts me in mind of was uh, I mentioned um, Bishop Healy's connections to the to the wider community in Portland and, and especially the non-Catholic uh, community. Uh, I wanted to mention um, uh, this summer um, on uh, Little Diamond Island uh, in in Casco Bay, there was a little ceremony because while he was there, Bishop Healy bought a cottage on Little Diamond, uh, which he would go to, you know, on his day off if there was such a thing. Uh, and he would bring the orphans out there for picnics and the sisters mm -hmm. would go out there and so on. And he, he built a cottage. He built a building for the sisters to stay in while they were there. And he built a building for the orphans to stay in mm -hmm. while they were there. And this summer, um, the, the uh, people who live on Little Diamond, um, uh, had organized an, an effort to identify the site of the cottage. And they put in a kind of walking trail, um, which uh, they dedicated um, on, on the island. <clears throat> and what was significant about that, I think, in, in Bishop Healy's time, uh, again, the 1880s and 90s, uh, there weren't many Catholics in Maine who could afford a place on Little Diamond Island uh, and, and couldn't use Little Diamond Island because it was that kind of Yankee Protestant um, uh, place uh, that, that uh, wouldn't have been, uh, been open to them. Uh, and so uh, when I learned of this, I thought it was great that the, the people on Little Diamond Island today uh, recognize uh, Bishop Healy's role uh, in the community and increasing understanding in the community and they they set up this little uh, this little uh, path with uh, historical markers uh, and so on. And they have plans to develop the site a little bit more. As, oh, uh, thank, thank as, you. Uh, we'll have so. to follow that up. Oh so, yeah, uh, take take the ferry out sometime. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I yeah. I mean, I as a young sister, I was out there for a few weeks because uh -huh. the girls from Saint Elizabeth's. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. 
And eventually, I'm not sure which bishop turned all of that over to us. Uh We owned it. And then at a certain point, perhaps in the 80s, we began selling off lots because we were not using it. Right. But it's interesting to know. Some of the buildings are still there. Yeah. The the um, oh, the pavilion, the huge building mm-hmm. that was for the children, where downstairs was uh, their dining room, their playroom if it was rainy. The right. second floor was rows and rows of these little cots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> now, it, you're talking about the orphanage also makes you think he was well known for his support for the children of the diocese and in the area. And if you know, if you know anything about that, could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I don't know a, a lot of a specific detail. Of course, with with Catholics in Maine being overwhelmingly uh, an immigrant population, a working class population, um, people on the lower economic rungs of society, um, that was a constant concern um, of of the church. Um, um, people in that position weren't necessarily able to take advantage of public resources to help them and so on. And so it became, uh, it became a, a central part of the church's social mission um, to do various kinds of programs that would, uh, on a really basic level, um, education and uh, health care and uh, food um, became became a central part of it. And again, thanks to good management abilities on the part of the sisters running the programs and, and bishops uh, and, and priests um, throughout the diocese, that that was necessarily a part of what of what they did. And, and to your point earlier about even this little diamond island, thanks to a history of the sisters here in Maine, Mm-hmm. We, I, I, it's helped me know where those orphanages were in Portland and where those mm-hmm. sites were because they've been detailed down to the address. Right. So it's right. been very helpful for me as the mission officer mm-hmm. here to, to be able to identify where in the city uh, right. that work took place. Would it be fair to say, so I, I don't think it would be unusual if while he was bishop, some people probably expressed or held negative attitudes relative to his race or story. But would it be fair to say that the prejudice he probably most have he most often probably had to address was anti-Catholic bias? Most directly, uh, I think on a day-to-day basis that was probably the case. Uh, again, um, uh, many people certainly knew the racial story of the of the family, um, but the but the more common um, the more common prejudice from the rest of society would have been. Uh, on the basis of religion uh, and on the on the basis of of, of class, um, you know, then as uh, in some ways now the poor often get blamed for being poor, um, but institutions uh, like the church are there to to counteract that. The other thing I want to do with my book, uh, um, Albert Foley was the uh, was the Jesuit who wrote the Beloved Outcast uh, book, which focused mainly on on uh, James Healy. But as soon as I became aware of the family, uh, what I wanted to do was look at the entire group of brothers and sisters. Certainly James Healy on his own was a remarkable figure. Um, But we look at him differently if uh, we once we realize uh, it wasn't just him. Uh, it was it was his brothers and sisters as well. So what was it? What was it like to have that that cohort of people, um, all brothers and sisters, all in the same generation, all related to one another, each one of whom had a career that, from one perspective, should not have happened at all. Um, okay, it happens once. That's fine. What if it happens six times or seven times? That I think um, uh, changes the story and. I think we understand each one of them if we try to understand them all collectively. Um, and I, I think that what probably, again, recalling from your book, one of the things that also we should acknowledge probably contributed to their success, they were a very close-knit family as well. That's right. So much so, I'm forgetting the priest's name that um, was uh, that, that James was um, lived with, or and initially he was very irritated with, with James Healy because of how close he was to his to his family. So the success, the success of this family is an intersecting of multiple layers, right? It's the mm-hmm. father who sends them north. It's the it's the bishop they happen the father happens to encounter 
It's the church that takes them in, but it's also the family. It's also the siblings, right? They had a very close knit relationship. That's right. They were they were an extremely close knit family. They wrote to one another all the time. Um, they would often vacation uh, with one another uh, on on their time off. So it was a family that that stuck together. You know, from a historian's perspective, the fact that they wrote to one another is great because it means there's a lot of documentation that allows for the reconstruction of of that story. Um, but the the married sister uh, and her family who lived in um, in Newton, Massachusetts, um, they also at some point uh, bought a house in Kennebunk, uh, and so the family would also gather in Kennebunk uh, in mm-hmm. in times off. Um, the brother who became a captain in the Coast Guard, his uh, tour of duty was between California and Alaska. And on at least one occasion, his brother Patrick, who was the former president of Georgetown, went along on the ship uh, for a, for a summer cruise. Um, uh, you know, the captain was working. Obviously, uh, Patrick was was there as a kind of observer. But that that's a measure of of mm-hmm. the family, you know, stuck together throughout the, throughout their lives, throughout their their adult lives. Um, and um, I think, uh, you know. Perhaps given the disabilities that society was prepared to impose on these folks, um, that's perfectly understandable. They're mm-hmm. they're sticking together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are there? Do you know? Are there any living descendants of the Healy's? There are, um, uh, uh, and the course of of the work, um, I um, I made contact with the descendants of the one married sister, um, and. Um, uh, actually, the the main uh, contact, uh, my main contact in the family is is a fellow named Tom Riley, uh, who became a uh, college professor, uh, studied Native American tribes, uh, and is now retired as a dean at North Dakota State University. But he and the rest of the family still come back every summer to Kennebunk. Uh, and uh, I visited them a couple of uh, a couple of years ago there. And we were all together for this dedication of the property on Little Diamond uh, this this past uh, this past uh, summer. So it's, um, uh, you know, the that family had long since passed over completely into the into the white community, uh, generation after generation, and I'll I'll tell this one story about my my contact with them. <clears throat> when I <clears throat> when I first met them, uh, now when I was back when I was working on the book, uh, because as I say, they had passed the family had passed into the white community. Uh, I asked uh, Tom and his his uh, brothers and sisters who were there. I asked them what they knew about the family story when they were growing up uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. And of course, at that time, in many quarters, the idea of passing for white was still seen as a kind of deception, you know? Um, But um, they told me, they each told me a version of the same story, uh, which was when they were early teenagers, um, uh, their father took them aside and said, Now, there's something you must know about the family. Uh, And he told them about the descent from the original couple uh, with the the slave mother. Um, uh, They also said, uh, the father told them that story and also told them, now, you must never talk about this with your grandmother. Their grandmother would have been the granddaughter of the original couple. Uh, And for her generation, the idea of so-called black blood in the family still would have had a, a taint to it. Uh, the Riley children themselves were fascinated by the story, were proud of the story, uh, and, and so on. But, but just within that family, you see the changing attitudes about race um, that are going on in the rest of American society. That's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, any final question, Mrs. Tamari? Do you have a final mm-hmm. comment or question? Well, what's spinning around in my head is there were other he- there was another Healy family in Maine that was close to Mother Evangelist, uh, right. who was a ward, and because uh, there was a Healy wing uh, on State Street, and I think they've transferred that name to the buildings right. at Four, uh, the Four River Mercy Hospital, uh, and so it's like mm-hmm. as it, 
particularly in the Portland area, having grown up in Portland, everybody seems to be related to one another. So, <laughs> but truly, well, our, if they our, were Irish. Our chap, yeah, sorry, go ahead, sister. No, no. So the potential, I mean, I'm thinking, were there other young Healy men? Um, but, you know, I don't know too much about the story. I just know that we got a lot of money uh, from the Healy investment. That that story is a wonderful story. That other Healy family that gave money to the Sisters of Mercy, uh, uh, practically an orphan who worked on the stock exchange, sweeping mm -hmm. the floors. And it eventually, you know, begins to make some money. And I think it was... So a standard oil shares mm -hmm. that we got. Um, and with that money, the Sisters of Mercy did a lot of good. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that would have been a, that would have been a, a different uh, Healy sure. family. Yeah. The, the family name uh, dies out in the subsequent generations because the, the sea captain um, had one son who died very young uh, before he married. Uh, the sea captain then adopted uh, uh, a, a child, and there's there are descendants through that line. But the bloodline, uh, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, would uh, would have ended there. Uh, Jim, thank you again for making your time available to us. Appreciate thank it. You. Good. Can, Thanks. Uh, happy, happy to be with you. <laughs> I highly recommend the book too. It's a very interesting book, and I think it is an important part of our history here in Maine, of, mm. of our capital history, as well as this remarkable and interesting family.